Now makes them the state uh, and through its hegemon actually does in a sense negotiate consent by providing something which people can indeed see as being uh, in their in their advantage. Um, now, uh, what it means, what this means is that in return the ruling system must make itself to some extent acceptable to the majority of the citizens if it isn't to rule like the white South Africans in Africa who rule simply because they've got more guns. And that is on the whole a rare and exceptional case, certainly in world kinds of societies. That means that the class struggle which isn't just for power, but in practice, at least on the part of the rulers, it's also for not losing hegemony. And conversely, for revolutionary movements, the struggle is also a struggle to gain, as it were, the high ground to get itself accepted as potentially a representative of society, of social order, something for everybody, and not just for its own members to be accepted as potentially the bearer of consensus for its political project, or the bearer of what Gramsci called the collective national will, or what Marx said for the proletariat to become the national class. A movement which can find itself to defining, defending or advancing purely sectoral or sectional interests of the working class could not, according to Gramsci, be such a movement which would change society uh, unless of course, we assume that the class it represented, the proletariat, formed the overwhelming majority of uh, the country, and at the same time that it was homogeneous, namely that all workers, in a sense, uh, would have the same interests and wouldn't uh, be uh, divided or capable of being divided against each other. Now, nowhere today are the workers the overwhelming majority of the population, the manual workers. They were once upon a time in Britain, not many other places. This is no longer the case even in Britain. Uh, and uh, the worst aspect of such a sectoral or sectional policy is what Gramsci called the sort of economic corporate approach, which is that of pure trade union sectionalism, and trade unionism. The sort of trade unionism which is no better even because even when it is idealized by parts of the left whenever its leaders have claimed that they personally are revolutionaries. Now, note more that the essential of the struggle for hegemony is to win the support of other classes and not only of your own social base. Gramsci's example and inspiration was, historical inspiration, was the formation of Italian unification, uh, in which the class is actually supporting the unity of Italy or having a direct economic interest in Italian unification, were quite a minority. But this actually also applies to majority movements. Even if therefore, I believe, implies, if you like, democracy, it implies not merely winning the consent of others, other classes, and this is all the more necessary now that the working class is a minority class and its social base is a relatively constricted social base, even if it extends its social base, it extends it to groups of people who are not quite the same as the manual industrial workers who once formed the core of it. It's got to restructure itself even this way. But it's got to win the consent, but also it's got to provide ways in which people express their consent. But another point really does follow an important point. Whereas power can be transferred or seized, if you like, hegemony can't. The two are two different things. One is, as it were, something which can be transferred by a once-for-all, if you like, step. Whether this is conceived as of winning a majority in Parliament or uh, a revolution uh, like the October Revolution and some other. But hegemony, 
being accepted as the carrier, if you like, of a project, a political project, which is worthy to be supported and by the whole of the people, or most of the people, and which disarms the minority who, are resist, who, who resist it. This has to be one, and it has to be one usually, or a good deal, it has to be one before power is transformed. And Gramsci's insistence was that the struggle, as it were, to win the moral high ground, or the national high ground for the labor, is one which begins long before it's the setting up of a mass working class party which was one of the main steps towards doing it. But unless that struggle is won and greatly advanced made before power is transformed, uh, the capacity to change society is limited. Now this applies both to revolutionary situations and to non-revolutionary situations, I believe. Take, for instance, uh, the classical example of a transfer of power by revolutionary means recently in Europe, which paid because the battle for hegemony had not been won. The Portuguese Revolution of 1974. No question about it that power is transferred. No question about it that the people who took power, revolutionary army officers and very largely communists who came out of jail and so on, were in a position and wanted to change. They failed. Portugal is not a socialist state now. It is not even very notably on the way to socialism because even if you've got power, unless you then are in a position to introduce a dictatorship cutting yourself from the rest of the world as, for instance, a sort of left-wing Pinochet thing, you need support and you need consent and there was not enough of it. The working class movement remained as it is today, it remained a very important block within Portugal, uh, but a minority block. And conversely, sections of the peasantry and the middle class were never, as it were, won over to the movement. So, for want of this, even though power had actually been transferred beyond all time, the capacity to change the society was severely limited for short, the short term fatal. If you look at the other hand, as an example which I don't like to quote because I don't like the people that have won the hegemony, namely the Iranian revolution. The Iranian revolution did indeed succeed in establishing hegemony, that's to say, that as soon as the, the, the uh, Shah had been overthrown, the new regime, in a sense, because it represented, uh, as it were, something which had legitimacy in the minds of most Iranians, particularly most poor Iranians, was able to mass major achievements, of which one of the most impressive is precisely that of being able uh, to wage uh, a major war uh, with enormous success uh, against a better armed, uh, though numerically smaller, enemy. Now, I'm not making a case for, God knows, uh, the Ayatollah and his life, but what I'm pointing out is this, the difference between a revolution which, as it were, backs up the mere fact of overthrowing an old state machinery and taking over and putting a new lot of people <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the others. Uh, now, in our country, labor, however large a majority it might have, could not do anything without some kind of consensus or some kind of support, especially if it needed to be re-elected. But that's not the essential point. The essential point, I think, at present is this. The essential weakness of the Labour movement and the Labour Party today is that it has given up the struggle for the high ground. It has become too defensive. It is reacting towards other people's hegemony and saying, well, we're 
we're, we're no, 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 no worse than you are in this respect.